switch for, since we are in the New York Academy of Medicine to something about the methodology and some of the results. It's very striking uh, when you read this book to see what kinds of things they were able to coax these college students into doing. What kind, as, as part of the experiments, the <laughs> research. Yes. How in the world did they do that? Well, let me especially let me say especially this. in the fifties. Let me say this: actually, a fairly small proportion of the research population were college students. Bill and Jenny were always looked down their noses at grand research efforts that were concentrated in 21-year-olds. Many of these were, uh, uh, I would say the majority actually were uh, between the ages of, of 25 and 50, which was not the college age population. Oh, okay. yeah, well, that's why it also became so radioactive in, uh, at Washington University, because not only uh, they had nurses, they had faculty wives. <laughs> How'd you like to go and, you know, to the, uh, the academy the next day after that. Well, um, well, let me just, so that our, the audience is with us. Surely. What, what kinds of things were they finding out? I mean, they, they were timing the time to orgasms, which you could only do by observing, which meant that somebody had to be having an orgasm in the room on the other side of the glass wall. In the laboratory. In the lab. And, they, and coming up with data such as females will have typically a four to five times orgasm, uh, let's see, at 0 0.8 second intervals. And that determining that sexual performance in men was not related to the size of the penis. And all these things that uh, really thoroughly documenting the female orgasm, which up until then had been the great mystery or the non-existent. The, the notion of the clitoral versus the vaginal orgasm, all of this okay. by direct observation. Now, this, this meant you had to get people to agree to be observed, get people to agree to have sex and, and have it documented, and somehow get the whole thing funded. How in the heck was that done? <laughs> I, I think Ginny particularly, Bill was not, shall we say, a strong people person. Uh, he was great on hard science, but Ginny, you know, one of the great uh, pleasures of this book, and I, I think Gin Ginny is a bit of a sensualist. She's a, a big part of a sensualist, but she's, she, the idea that she was able to recruit all these volunteers uh, through her charisma, through her charm, through her sense of sexuality. There's all, one of the great pleasures to me was talking all these gentlemen 75, 80, 85, who were all doctors who had been contemporaries of Bill, who were all enamored of, of Ginny. And uh, she had them wrapped around her finger. It was almost as if Ava Gardner <laughs> was the person in charge. And in many ways, she was the driving force. Uh, Howie Masters has said that to me several times. He has said to me that in many ways, uh, the two together, it was that old equation, one plus one does not equal two in this. It's and even more than that. It's like 57 together. But this, this Ava Gardner picture, <laughs> Right. It, when you get the book, take a look at this photograph. It, uh, she was a sexy lady. Yeah. But, but let me say that the remarkable thing there was that it was in part Bill Masters' seriousness and austerity that gave people the instant understanding that this was not some lascivious experiment. This wasn't some, t it, because under different circumstances it might well have been. Those of you who have read the biographies about Kinsey and his team know that in their spare time, all the Kinsey researchers were having group sex and sex with animals and doing all these different things. Masters and Johnson always ran a program that was devoid of that co-participation. But the other thing is, it is important to remember that in the recruiting process, where certainly not everybody that first signed up to come look at the lab and have a walk through while they were fully clothed and not doing anything sexual to sort of get comfortable. Not everyone said, oh, sure, I'll continue on. And Ginny sometimes personally spent as much as a dozen hours with a couple to acclimate them and to get their permission before they were hooked up to an EKG machine or a pulmonary monitor. 
this was a physiology laboratory. This wasn't Cecil B. DeMille filming what was going on. Yeah. There ultimately was some anatomical and physiologic filming, but no plot lines, no, uh, <laughs> no silky oils and things like that. It was, it was more akin to filming an appendectomy or a, a medical education documentary. Well, th that, is tr that is definitely true. However, using the film analogy, you ever see those old Frankenstein movies where the, you see the zapping of uh, the electrical power from one thing and the, their hair is out like this? There was a cer certain kinetic energy that came up, uh, about from observing all of this that definitely did uh, spill out. Certainly, it was part of the, 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 the one place where Bill Masters t made an exception for the staff not having any inter interpersonal relationship was actually with his relationship with yep. Ginny. Gotcha. And that's often in that context, that part of that, the, uh, the rationale of that, or part of the explanation, was that there was all this pent up energy. It's almost well, like how a- How many uh, years did they work together before they re he divorced and they married? Um, about 13. 13, 13 years. years, yeah. And for how much of that time were they having? 12 and a half. Yeah. 12 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Give or take. Yeah. Okay. There, Tom's right, but remember.